Imagine this, you're in the hospital and you've just ordered an RBC transfusion for your patient. Minutes later, the nurse calls. Doctor, the patient looks sick. What's the first thing that runs through your mind? What are the possible causes? How do you figure out what's going on? And more importantly, how do you treat this patient? Well, those are precisely the questions we'll answer today. So grab a drink and let's dive together into everything any doctor should know about transfusion reactions. Okay, so there are many types of transfusion reactions, but five of them make up the vast majority of what you'll see in clinical practice and what you'll be asked in your boards. And there's a very easy mnemonic to remember these five. Fever, halo. Fever is for febrile non-hemolytic reaction. H stands for hemolytic reactions, which include both the acute and the delayed types. A is for allergic reactions, that is arranged from mild itching and hives to full-blown anaphylaxis. L refers to lung injury in a syndrome we know as trolley or transfusion-related acute lung injury. And finally, O is for overload, specifically a syndrome we call TACO, transfusion-associated circulatory overload. Now, each of these reactions has a unique clinical pattern, so let's go through them. Let's start with the febrile non-hemolytic reaction. This is the most common and usually the mildest syndrome of the bunch. It is believed to be caused by pro-inflammatory cytokines released with the administration of the blood product. It presents with fever and chills that begin within 1-4 to four hours after the transfusion starts. Importantly, there is no hypotension, no low back pain and no renal compromise. Now let's contrast this with an acute hemolytic reaction. This one is a medical emergency. It is caused by ABO incompatibility that leads to a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction where the recipient's antibodies attack donor red blood cells, causing intravascular hemolysis. And the keyword here is intravascular. This usually develops very shortly after the transfusion starts and presents with non-specific signs like fever and chills, as we just saw in the previous complication, but also hypotension tachycardia, flank or lumbar pain, and dark urine from hemoglobinuria. In severe cases, this can progress to DIC and renal failure. So, just to recap, just fever and chills, febrile non-hemolytic reaction. Fever, chills, plus hypotension, low back pain, renal compromise, that is acute hemolytic reaction. Okay? Now, let's move on to the delayed hemolytic reaction. Unlike the acute version, this one is actually not that concerning. It occurs in patients who were previously sensitized to non-ABO red blood cell antigens, usually through prior transfusions, pregnancy, or transplants. Upon re-exposure to these antigens, their immune system launches a response leading to extravascular hemolysis. Keyword, extravascular. So, acute hemolytic reaction, intravascular hemolysis. Delayed hemolytic reaction, extravascular hemolysis. Now, here signs and symptoms are more subtle and usually consist just of fever, mild jaundice, and maybe anemia. And importantly, they occur days to weeks after the transfusion was given. Okay, perfect. Next up, we have allergic reactions. These are caused by a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction to plasma proteins in the donor blood. The spectrum here goes from mild to potentially lethal. Mild allergic reactions typically present with just skin symptoms like hives or maybe some itching. But on the other hand, anaphylaxis, which is the most severe complication, presents as we all know with systemic compromise characterized typically by bronchospasm, angioedema, and cardiovascular collapse. And now let's compare the final two complications, trolley and taco. The first thing to know about these, apart from their complicated name, is that they both cause dyspnea and pulmonary edema, but for completely different reasons. Trolley, on the one hand, is an inflammatory condition. It is caused by donor antibodies in the transfused product that activate neutrophils in the lungs, leading to a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. It presents with respiratory distress, plus systemic inflammatory signs like hypertension and fever. On the other hand, TACO, as the name suggests, is all about volume. Here, there's simply too much blood going around and the heart cannot handle the volume adequately, which leads to a cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Here patients also present with dyspnea but not with inflammatory signs. Instead they have congestive signs like hypertension, JVD and an S3 gallop. So dyspnea plus hypertension JVD is taco and dyspnea plus hypertension and fever is trolley. Perfect, now let's talk about how to approach these patients. And first things first, stop the transfusion. This is the most important and immediate step no matter the reaction. And sure, it may not be strictly necessary in all patients, but hey, better safe than sorry, right? After this, you usually check vital signs and assess ABCs. 
We also notified the blood bank to make sure a mistake didn't occur and we order specific tests depending on what we're suspecting. Suspect hemolysis? Order a direct Coombs test. And also in the acute hemolytic reactions, order bilirubin levels and haptoglobin levels. Suspect trally or TACO? Order a chest x-ray and consider BMP levels to rule out TACO. Think it's anaphylaxis? Do the immediate treatment first and then rule out an IgA deficiency. Wait, what? IgA deficiency? What does a humoral immunodeficiency have to do with this? That's a great question. You see, in IgA deficiency, patients develop antibodies against IgA, as they don't have that antigen. And when they receive products that contain IgA, as it happens with blood transfusions, their immune system treats the IgA molecules as foreign antigens because they are foreign antigens, and that triggers anaphylaxis. This is very important to keep in mind because some patients with IgA deficiency don't present with the typical immunodeficiency picture, and sometimes their presentation is literally just anaphylaxis induced by blood products. And the boards really love to test this concept, so make sure you understand it fully. All right, now let's go through the treatment for each type of transfusion reaction. And just to be absolutely clear, I'll repeat myself one more time. For all of these reactions, the first step in treatment is usually the same. Stop the transfusion. After that, the next steps depend on the suspected diagnosis. In febrile and non-hemolytic reactions, we usually treat with antipyretics like acetaminophen. That's it. Now, to prevent recurrence, the key is to use leuk-reduced blood products in future transfusions. And this is also a highly tested concept, so try to keep it in mind. In acute hemolytic reactions, after stopping the transfusion, the next step in treatment is usually to start IV fluids, and if the patient remains hypotensive, use vasopressors. You also need to monitor clinically and with labs for signs of renal failure and disseminated intravascular coagulation. Delayed hemolytic reactions, on the other hand, don't usually require any significant intervention. You simply monitor the patient, maybe measure a controlled hemoglobin level, and make sure to perform antibody screening so this doesn't happen again in the future. For allergic reactions, treatment depends on the severity. Mild cases like hives or itching can be managed with antihistamines. But if the patient develops anaphylaxis, you need to administer epinephrine, extract IV fluids, and provide ventilatory support as needed. With trally and TACO, we also provide ventilatory support as needed, but in TACO specifically, we also administer IV diuretics to reduce the fluid overload. Now, one important note is that in order to prevent TACO in future transfusions, consider using a lower infusion rate or splitting the units. This is also a highly tested concept, so keep it in mind. And that concludes our review of the transfusion reactions. Now it's time to put your knowledge to the test. To do this, go over to Lecture Integrated Cubank and try some clinical cases. In fact, here are a couple for you to get started. Drop your answer and rationale for each case in the comment section below. Hope you found this useful. Thanks for your time, and we'll see you in the next one.